You know, and your own law says you are God's. How can you get on me for saying, I'm the son of God? They love this stuff. This is where the Jewish religious leaders camped out. This spoke to them. This gave them something to debate about. This gave them something to talk about over lunch. This is what really excited them. Doesn't do it for you, does it? Doesn't do it for me, but you know what it did at the time? The rocks got a little heavy. You know, they came from up here down to here. And they looked at each other. And they said, who's going to answer that one? Because we've got to answer it. We've got to be right. We've got to be able to throw these rocks at this guy. We've got to be able to stone this shepherd. And they looked at each other and said, hmm, new one? Don't know how to answer that one? We're going to have to have a huddle. Right? Okay. So Jesus has bought himself some time by appealing to their religious arguments. He says, um, where are we? Verse 3 says, What about the one whom the Father set apart as his very own and sent into the world? Why then do you accuse me of blasphemy when they say, I am God's Son? Do not believe in me unless I do what my Father does. But if I do it, even though you do not believe in me, believe in the evidence of the miracles that you may learn and understand that the Father is in me, and I in the Father. Again, they tried to seize him. But he escaped from their grasp. We can't stone you right now because we don't have the answer to that, but we want you to be right here when we get the answer. Hold him. Grab him. Seize him. Okay. We have some people that don't want to see God and Jesus. Even though he's doing these amazing miracles. They have to acknowledge, yeah, he's done some great miracles, good. But you know what? You really bother us because you're not like us. And we don't see how God can be in you. We don't. We, we're just not going to see it. We're not going to see it. Got a nice little religious argument there. We're going to have to think about that one. We'll come back. Don't go away. I'm hanging on to my rocks. We've seen this over and over again, haven't we? Over and over and over. Why does John have to keep bringing this home to his argument, to his audience? Why does he have to bring it up over and over again? These people were not going to listen. They had God figured out. They had the Messiah figured out. And he looked just like them. And Jesus didn't fit that picture. Therefore, he couldn't be him. No matter what kind of miracles he did. No matter... No matter how he talked to him, no matter what analogies he used, no matter, it just wasn't going, they were going to kill him. John's audience needed to hear that. Because for some reason, they started to glorify these people and emulate them to be like them, to make the same religious arguments to raise up certain people over other people and say, oh, this guy's more special than you. This guy knows more than you. He's more holy than you. You need to come to this person. And John would say, no, you forgot about Jesus. All you need is Jesus. He's all you need. Now, there's a really interesting ending to this story. It says here, in verse 40, then Jesus went back across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing in the early days. Here he stayed, and many people came to him. They said, though John never performed a miraculous sign, all that John said about this man was true. And in that place, many believed in Jesus. Now, we're not going to get Jesus anywhere near Jerusalem again for a while, except when his friend Lazarus dies in the next chapter. And he goes back and his disciples said, what are you, crazy going back there? They're trying to kill you. Don't you remember? He said, yeah, but we're going back anyway. And then, 
during Passover that next spring where he goes back and he lays down his life. I think what's fascinating about this is where does he go in the meantime? Where does he go to recharge? Where does he go to prepare himself for this final act that we celebrate every Sunday morning? He goes out by Jordan. He goes out where he was baptized. That's where Jesus was baptized. Wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it be great if you could just, for a little while, go back to where you were baptized? Wouldn't it be great to, to remember the feelings that you had when you made that commitment to Jesus? And some of us, it might have been at, at camp, at Christian camp. Do you remember that feeling of how, how you felt so loved and cherished? How when you came out of that water, you felt so, you felt so pure? You felt so innocent. You felt like God had been at work in your life. If we could just go back and just remember. And that's one really exciting thing about seeing people make that commitment to Jesus. It reminds you of the commitment you made when you were baptized. It's like going to a wedding. And it reminds you of the joy that you had at that time in your life. And Jesus went out and he spent some time out there where John's gone. Right? John's been beheaded at this point. And the people out there were going, you know, yeah, we used to listen to John. And he talked about Jesus. And everything he said was true. John never did a miracle. But man, this guy is something else. And many believed in him. And that's where Jesus stayed until he went back. Until he went back to make that sacrifice. I think that's what the Lord's Supper is supposed to do for us every Sunday. Bring us back. To bring us back to that commitment we made and why we made that commitment. To bring us back to those joyful feelings, that, 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 that sense of lightness that kind of came when you realized that all your sins have been washed away. Yeah. That they are all gone. That you are a new creation. Behold, the old is gone, the new has come, Paul said. That's, that's why we celebrate. Amen. The blood that washed away your sins. The body, the body, the sacrifice that Jesus laid down. He said, and no one can take it from me. He said, I'm going to lay it down for you. And I'm going to do that for you. So each Sunday, we gather, we take a little piece of bread, and we remember that Jesus had a body, and it wasn't just a fairy tale. Mm -hmm. And we take some fruit of the vine, and we remember that Jesus' life, His blood, His lifeblood was poured out for us. Mm -hmm. So we could be completely different people. Mm -hmm. And so we could remember. Remember the joy. Remember that Fantastic feeling that God is at work in my life and God has brought me to this point and now we're going to work together. I am going to submit to Jesus as Lord every day, everything I do. And that's my desire. And we can remember that every Sunday. This morning, we're going to take the Lord's Supper and we're going to do it by coming forward and tearing a piece of bread and dipping it. And as you do that, remember. Remember that feeling of God being at work in your life and what God has done for you. And that feeling of freshness and that feeling of, of purity, that feeling of that freedom that, that <laughs> my sins have been washed away. Amen. And God has made me whole. 